welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm here with Mark Blythe. He's a political economist at Brown University. He's the author of Angry Nomics, which I finished reading about 25 minutes ago. Uh, and he's originally from Dundee. Hello, Mark. Hello there. And uh, I'm guessing you're a guitarist for those who are uh, just listening. There's a, an array of guitars behind Mark right now. Well, there's the guitars on this wall, but there's a drum kit on the other side. So my pandemic sanity routine was to learn to play drums. So that's okay. what I've been doing most of. And I was actually originally a bass player for a long time. So, you know, that's what you do. You, when you're my age, you disappear into the basement and relive your teenage years <laughs> one way or another. Right. And you're also a stand-up comedian at one point. Is that right? Yeah, but I mean, I was a musician for like a billion times longer than I was a stand-up comedian. So, you know, it's a bit of a... And, and I'm actually a professor. So, you know, it's a bit of a stretch to say I was a stand-up comedian. I dabbled. Let's put it this way. You I dabbled. dabbled. But the longest career you've had is in being an academic of in political economies. Because, yes, you know, it does. Exactly. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, well, of all, first of all, and I know you've written more than one book, but the book I've read is Angry Nomics, and I, you know, I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, thank you, um, yeah, for making the effort to write this book and put something into layman's terms. You know, I, I have, I have an engineering background, not an econ economics background, so it was, uh, you know, it was. Uh, I found it um, entirely possible to read it. <laughs> Excellent. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Eric and I, we're, our mission was basically somebody who's like you, right? Who basically has an entirely different background, who's kind of interested in like why the world seems to be so pissed off and angry at the moment, has three hours for a flight. You're going somewhere. Remember back in the day when we flew places? And so the, the imaginary was you go to the bookstore at the airport, look at that cover and go, that looks interesting. I hope it's not going to bore me to death with economics lectures. Oh, that looks kind of fun. It's a dialogue. And that was it. So yeah. I'm glad that it worked. Yeah, and it might be the first, perhaps the first... Yeah, certainly the first ever book to make me laugh out loud. Economics book, first economics book to make me laugh out loud. Excellent, so, excellent. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so, yeah, the world is an angry place. Um, it seems to have got a lot angrier even than, than before you wrote this book, you know, with the sort of divide now, you know, on, on, on vaccines and so on. So, um, it, you know, it seems like a, a book that the world needs as some kind of way to understand what's happening and what the solutions might be. Um, I suppose, well, should we just start with what, what you see as being the major factors, the dynamics that are, are feeding this anger right now? Yeah, sure. So my co-author, Eric, he's the one who's really interested in anger as a, a psychological phenomenon. And I am too. And that came from going to a Watford Everton game about three years ago. And hanging out in the sort of the Watford end of the, let's say, the ultras, if you can imagine Watford having ultras. And what we noticed was something very interesting, that the angriest fans don't actually abuse the opposition that much. They abuse each other. They abuse their own players for not trying hard enough. They abuse each other for not singing hard enough. And in a, in a kind of, you know, sense, what they do is they solve the collective action problem for how to be militant. Right? They're the police that make you become the soldiers on the front line. They're, the, if you will, the sort of the NCOs in the army that basically encourage you to go run into flying objects and bits of steel, right? So we thought, well, you know, why is it sort of angry old white men spend huge amounts of money traveling around the country in shitty weather to watch not very good football? And part of it is because of the identity vacuum that's filled by the sense of collective action and collective identity with a team or whether it's with politics or whatever. So that's kind of, if you will, the micro side of it. And the macro side of it, I got into talking to tech people because I was interested in this whole phenomenon of robots are taking over and, you know, AI, this, that, and the next thing. And I've lived long enough through the 1990s tech bust and all the rest of it to kind of know bullshit when I smell it. And I was wondering, you know, how much of this stuff is real and how much of it's nonsense? So I started going to tech conferences, and the only way I could get in there was if I ended up talking to the tech conference. And it turns out tech people are really interested in economics, but basically the minute you put an economist in front of them, they get totally lost. So I came up with an analogy, which is the middle of the book, right? Which is, well, if you imagine it, capitalism, in a sense, is a computer, and what it's solving for is kind of informational efficiency. Then you've got hardware, which are the different bits of capitalism, labor markets, capital markets, firms, right? And every country has some version of the same form of hardware configured in different ways. And then at any given moment, there's a set of economic ideas about how we should run this thing, right? So the gold standard and let things flow around the world. 
or the kind of post-war Keynesian period of very strict national economies and big labour and big business, and then the neoliberal period, which was different again. And what we kind of what I ended up doing with these talks with the tech people is to try and explain it as kind of software, hardware, and compatibilities that build up over time. And if you very quickly run through this, you see that what happens with the gold standard era from the 1870s up to World War I is that it creates permanent price deflation. Why? Because everybody wants to have gold rather than lose gold. And for that to happen, everybody has to run a surplus. But that's mathematically impossible. For every person running a surplus, there has to be a deficit. So you end up with basically falling prices all the time. And when you do that, one of the major prices is wages at the same time as a very small minority of people are making a ton of cash. So it's basically a massive inequality generator, very much like the world that we live in just now. The crash for that system was World War I, the Great Depression, and the big rewrite of the software was after World War II, which was, let's not do that, let's worry about full employment. Right, well, when you run an economy with full employment as the target, you end up generating inflation. Why? Because it means that labour gets really strong. Sorry, I just didn't, so, so with the idea of, of shooting, because because I, I love that part of the book where you lay out the version one, two, and three. Yeah. Uh, but the, but the idea of so version three is the the goal is full employment, and was the was as the idea then to avoid this inequality problem by creating full inf- employment. Yeah. The, so the lesson learned from the first one was if you just allow labour to be treated as another price on the market, and that price keeps going down, eventually they turn fascist or communist, and that's really bad if you hold property. Right. So then the lesson learned in world, after World War II is let's not do that again. Let's make sure people have jobs. Let's make sure they have this thing called a welfare state. And the problem with that is, is if you run it for 30 years, the software hardware incompatibility is called inflation. Because what it means is that labor has tremendous pricing power in labor markets. And the only way firms can cope is by pushing up prices. So you get that kind of wage price spiral that leads to the 70s. After each of these two big events, these crashes, the software gets rewritten. Right, So if you think about the end of World War I, boom, Keynesianism. You think about after the end of the 1970s, you get Thatcher, Reagan, neoliberalism, the whole thing, right? Rise of independent central banks, all that sort of stuff. Then comes 2008. 2008 is very similar to version 1.0, the gold standard. It's deflationary and inequality generating. The way that we covered up that gap was by liberating the banking sector everywhere. So everybody loads up on credit. That credit is inherently fragile because it's dependent upon people's incomes continuing to rise to pay the debts, which ain't happening. So all you need is a bunch of shitty mortgages coming along, you're going to tip the system into critical. What didn't happen in 2008 was no one rewrote the software. We just turned around to the central banks and said, hey, can you just flood the world with cash and hopefully things will be okay? And that's what we did. And then we got hit by COVID. And all of the same bugs in the software, rising inequality, a feeling of great uncertainty in the workplace, a lack of control in your life and in your workplace. Think about Amazon workers, cleaners being with uh, ankle bracelets being monitored as they go from room to room, right? And chronically low wages in many of the large economies in the world. People are pissed. And they're really pissed because nobody seems to want to reset the model, to rewrite the software. So if you think about what populism is, if you think about Brexit, if you think about Trump, it's essentially rogue code writers basically say, nah, nah, this system sucks. We need to basically rewrite the software. Here's my version of the new code, right? And that's basically how we think about it. Right, right. Yeah, but when I when I reflect on it, what a lot of what that code writing is, it, that it's, it's through a cultural lens. And what's kind of interesting is the book. Yeah. Now, the book is you don't really go anywhere near culture. Culture war, it was a phrase, doesn't even appear, I don't think, in the book. So you've, you've kind of completely sidestepped that and kind of really focused in, you know, as the title might suggest, yeah, like here, on the underlying why. economics. Yeah. Well, here's why. I mean, and this is the argument I'll have with Matt Goodwin and people like that who, you know, who, who write really good stuff about the cultural side, right? Is that ultimately you can't explain a cultural shift by reference to a cultural shift, right? You can't say there's more racism around because there's more racists. You kind of have to explain where one of the other one came from. And the economy is always experienced through a cultural lens, right? I grew up in Dundee. Dundee was in recession from the moment I was born, right? I mean, it's kind of the Flint, Michigan of Scotland in that way. And what that means is the people that I grew up with, being on the dole was normalized, right? Um, expecting the economy to fail you was normal. So that creates a set of expectations and behaviours and cultural tropes. I remember when I went to California in 1991 for the first time, 
I arrived there a jaded Scottish person. Within three weeks, with all that sunshine, I had running shoes and I was running around and being optimistic, right? So your experience of, because everyone's so relentlessly positive and they're talking about tech and there's this new thing and it's amazing, right? And at first, you know, your jaded self is like, oh, this is all bullshit. And after you're all like, well, this is kind of awesome, right? And, you know, so your experience of the economy has to be culturally mediated depending on where you are. So I think that's a given. But I don't think that's where you can start the explanation from. We have to go through the bigger shifts that have affected us. What's changed? What's different? Why now do people feel stressed? Think about it this way. The British economy is, by some measures, two to three times the size it was in 1980, right? And per capita GDP has never been higher. Yet at the same time, child poverty is at nearly an all-time high. And overall poverty rate of the country is twice what it was in 1980. So, you know, when you, you look at one side of that and it's like, it's amazing, it's twice the size and everyone's richer on average. Yeah, problem is we don't live in an average. That, that distribution is incredibly skewed. And for the people at the bottom, it really sucks. Yeah, like it, there's some amazing steps here. In Europe, you were saying, um, what is it here? You've got um, 10%, um, 10% have 37% of the income, right? Yeah, also, yeah. Um, and the U and the US is even it's even crazier. I mean, it's uh, the top one percent effectively now have about twenty four percent. Top ten percent, top ten percent, I think, is coming up for forty at this point. So it's an astonishing concentration of wealth. The interesting thing we also try and get into the book is while it's also absolutely true that not all old people are rich, it is absolutely true that almost all rich people are old. So there's an important generational shift here, and you see that in Britain in terms of. If you were a boomer and you basically started buying property anywhere near London in the 1980s, you are now a millionaire. Right. Right. And what that means is the kids, because people live longer, are waiting for these inheritances, which basically when they finally do transfer because of the high values that we have for property and other assets like financial assets, which is all located in this one class, it's going to be really hard to reduce inequality in our societies, even if you have more progressive tax policy. Because in a sense, you're, you're just transferring advantage from the dead to the living when they go because of the concentration of these assets in such a small number of hands. So again, that's you know fascinating outcome that we don't really think about. Yeah, well, my parents, uh, uh, when we were just going to get through the other night, they're, they're now on paper millionaire, between them, a millionaire, right? Yeah, right, <laughs> right, and, exactly. And my, my, my mother was a social worker, and my dad was a, you know, an averagely paid engineer, right? He wasn't, he, you know, he said he wasn't an executive or rich in any way, and now they're, they're you know, they've got over a million pounds of papers. So, yeah, just through housing, just through housing investments, right? Just That's through housing, the, exactly. Now, now, add in sort of, you know, the the class above them that was able to basically buy into the liberalisation of finance in the 1980s, the ones who have got decent stocks and share portfolios, etc. The returns on that have been compounding at 6% a year for 30 years, right? Just do the math. It's astonishing. But right. the thing is, it's all held in very few hands. And ultimately, you know, people say, you know, a lot of sociologists will tell you people don't really care about inequality, they care about fairness, they don't care about inequality, they care about being feeling precarious. And I think that that's true. But to me, the underlying generator of that is still the fact of that inequality. You wouldn't feel precarious, your life wouldn't be precarious if you had more assets. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the yeah. thing. Yeah. Now, what I'd like to do, because this was almost my favorite part of the book for somebody who's read some economics books without any background, and I always feel fairly lost in economics books, but I kind of persevered through them. And what I liked was the way you you laid out this version 2.0 and, and version 3.0. And I just thought I'd go over it again because it you know it just made some sense to me. So you're saying that version 2.0, this is this period from 45 to 80. The yep. goal was full employment. We saw this the labor share of GDP go up, right? Which I think we can inequality went down. Corporate profits weren't particularly high. We had tended to have national economies, strong unions, finance wasn't particularly powerful. And central banks were fairly weak, and legislators were strong. So politicians had like real power. Yeah, and then, exactly. And this is what this is what really resonated. You know, this kind of made sense to me. And then post nineteen eighty, uh, the focus was on price stability. And so, and just for like you know, just for people who aren't familiar with the lexicon, what does that like really mean? Price stability. Then, well, you'd live through a period of reasonably high inflation. I mean, the seventies get exaggerated as if it's like Zimbabwe or something like this, right? It wasn't. 
But what it did mean was that year on year prices were rising in some cases for a for about a five year period at about six to eight to ten percent. And that's difficult because what that means is your real wage, let's say prices go up 10% in a year. That means that the wage you get paid, your real wage, right? Once you take that 10% increase into account, is now worth 90% of what it was. So if you have strong unions, what are they going to do? They're going to say, we need 11% just to stand still. Well, if you do that, then the firm that's got to pay that has got to find that from somewhere. And, you know, their profit margin starts to go down in order to pay that. So they push it on in prices, right? And that's how you stoke that whole inflationary process. So price stability, the mantra, if you will, of the, of the Thatcher government in many ways, but also the European Central Bank and the EMU project, etc., was we need to stop this. We need to have stable prices. Now, why do you need stable prices? Because if I'm an investor, if I'm the basic sort of like, uh, how can I put it, the catalyst of capitalism, right? Without investment, there's nothing, right? People have to take risk. There has to be entrepreneurship. There has to be dedicated firms that have been doing this, you know, BASF in Germany has been making chemicals for 130 years, right? They're all over the place. They're, they're massive. They're, they're, they're a great company, right? You never think about them, right? But they're the workhorse for investment. Now, if they're expecting, if an entrepreneur or a firm is expecting a rate of return of, let's say, 5% real, and what that means is I'm getting 5% on my investment regardless of the rate of inflation. If inflation goes to 10%, I might as well take the money around the back of the house and use it as kindling for a barbecue because I've just lost 5% on the investment, right? So that's what was happening in the 1970s. And weirdly enough, a guy who predicted this was a, a Polish-Hungarian economist called Mikhail Kolecki back in 1943. It's an incredible piece. You can get it online if you just do Kolecki, Political Problems of Full Employment. He writes a seven-page article, no math, right, just all prose. In, the, in 1943, where he basically predicts the 1970s and says, look, if you do this full employment thing, eventually you're going to run into this problem. And the investor class are going to go, enough. And they're going to go to their, polit their politicians, the right wing and the center right, and say, you need to do something about this because there's no point in having capitalism if I can't have profits. And inflation's yeah. killing my profits, right? So a really simple way to think about the rise of Thatcher and Reagan and everything else was that basically it was capitalism without profits. And at that right. point, you either have socialism, right? And if you think about Britain in 1976, that was the decision that was made in cabinet. Tony Benn and various people wanted to go with what they called the alternative economic strategy, which would have been nationalize the banks, uh, shut the economy off to imports, right? I mean, massive, massive government intervention, wartime level, right? And then on the other hand was, we're going to suck it up and take a loan from the IMF, which paved the way basically towards Thatcher and all the rest of it. So that was that critical moment that happened in the 1980s. Right, right. And so now you're, you're focused on this. You've, so capital gets, get a, capital gets a greater share yeah. of, of income. The wages go down. Inequality goes up, which we've seen. There's this globalization. Um, finance becomes more mo mobile and more, more powerful. Um, and the central banks become more powerful. And interestingly, and you talk about this in the book, that the legislators, the politicians become less powerful. They become impotent. Yeah. Right, because if you've basically said all we're going to do is worry about uh, the general level of prices, the most important thing you can do is hand all power over at the central banks, let them set interest rates, and do, above all of your politicians, don't try and spend any money. Because if you do, all you'll probably do is create inflation. That was at least the story. Now, the sort of, if you will, the, the theoretical high-tech macroeconomics behind this contains all the stuff about the Nehru, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment and vertical Phillips curves and blah, blah, blah. But the intuition behind it's pretty simple, which is at any given point in time, the economy can only produce so much stuff and so many jobs. If you just dump a ton of cash into the economy, all that happens is you're going to bid up the price of those things and those services. You're going to get inflation. So the best thing you can do is actually do micro reforms in labor markets and make people e easier to move from job to job and allow capital to move to its highest return and increase those kind of micro efficiencies because you can't basically get past the speed limit of the economy, right? That was the way that they thought about it after 1980. Now, that was a really good theory and it made a lot of sense, particularly in that moment. But the problem is when you look at that kind of speed bump for the economy, if it's defined in terms of unemployment, Britain has had everything from 3% from to 12% unemployment over the past 30 years, at a more or less constant rate of inflation by the time you get to 1990 of around 2 to 
So what that implies is that speed limit isn't really a speed limit. You can push it. And what we've now done with COVID and what we did with the financial crisis is we've also kind of proved that because we've dumped trillions of dollars into the economy. And it turned out that basically the economy was much smaller than we thought it was, which is obvious if you look at wages and inequality and labor share. Of course, it's smaller than it could be. But the people at the top have done fabulously, right? And if you now dump all this economy, uh, money in the economy, it's actually not pushing up prices that much. And it hasn't done at least since the financial crisis. And that's really interesting because that gives you room to think again about how we should think about this problem with the speed limit and inflation which is what the Biden stuff is all about. It's kind of like where the central banks are now. It's a very different space. Right, right. But, but, but just get, sort of coming back to that, this, this capitalism 3.0. So, but of course, the idea was that, that everybody benefits, right? Because the right. idea is that the trickle down, right? You know, the, this, the tide ra- raises all ships. And it, of course, that's turned out not to be the case um, because we've got wages that have stagnated and we've got what you describe as trickle up um, uh, where we where you've got an increasing share of of income and wealth at the top, right? Yeah, there's a there's and a again. If anyone listening wants to check out the numbers on this, there's an organization in California called the Rand Corporation, which is basically a kind of Cold War think tank. So they're definitely not lefties, and they did a piece last year called Trends in Income 1975 to Present or 1980 to Present. Just do Trends in Income Rand, you'll find it. And they did the numbers on this and basically said, if you took the US economy and you didn't do any of the tax or regulatory, i.e. institutional changes that has happened since the 1980s, if you just kept it as it was in 1980 and ran the economy forward, how different would be the distribution in terms of who has what? And their estimate is that over $40 trillion has trickled up to basically the top 1%. Not billion, trillion dollars over that 30-year period. And at the same time, if you hadn't have done that, your average American worker would have been $16,000 a year better off. Mm. I personally think people are less pissed off when they have more money. Right? If you, if you do talk to poverty researchers, what they tell you about poor people is one of the reasons that they're you know, driven to drink and drugs and angry and pissed off all the time is because you don't have any control. And you don't have any control because you don't have any money. Right? If you go to the store and you never have to worry about what you're buying for groceries for your family, that's a huge, wonderful thing not to worry about. So there's a huge amount. Half of America now earns $20 an hour or less. And anybody who then talks about the American dream of home ownership and going to college on $20 an hour, you're basically laughing in the face of half the country. And it's not funny. Right, yeah, and people are beginning to put these pieces together, and that's what generates a lot of the anger and distrust and resentment. I mean, yeah. if everybody in Congress is a millionaire and they won't raise taxes on themselves, but they talk about inequality all the time, why should anyone believe them? Right, right. And I think, and the other thing that I find interesting is that it, it yes, it's absolute level of you know income and and where you are in the order, but it's also decline, right? Because you, you did this analysis, you, you brought up this analysis in Germany, which I found really interesting is the AFD, you know, the um the sort of nationalist right wing yeah. party and anti-immigration party in Germany, um, it has seen rises in the areas that haven't had the most immigration because that tended to right. go to the south. But in the north, but what they those areas have experienced is a a reduction in income, right? So it's not absolute level of income necessarily. It's have you experienced a recent degradation? Yeah, exactly. And, and even have, a long term slide. Yeah. And this is Boston Lincolnshire. This is Boston, right? This is sort of Boston Brexit, right? Oh, they're quite wealthy. Yeah, but they used to be wealthier. They also used to have lots of young people, and they've all moved to London. And now they're surrounded by immigrants that do all the work, right? So it doesn't take a genius to put one and two together and make four, right? So yeah, it's exactly that feeling of, uh, particularly the East German example. You know, if, if you're East German and you didn't do well in the transition to when the country came together, then you've lived, been living in public housing, probably crappy ex-communist public housing. Uh, you've been living largely off state benefits. You're being told you're a loser all the time because you can't move and you can't upskill or whatever it is, and it's all your fault. And there's no training money for you, and the schools around you are terrible, and none of the kids seem to do well. And then suddenly a million refugees kip up, and uh, the government goes, yeah, if you're shaffing us, we can do this. We can bring all these people in. Well, yeah, guess what? That's going to create an absolute ton of resentment. Yeah. I mean, again, you don't. This, none of this is complex. Yeah, 
and 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 interestingly, not in the areas where the immigrants immigrants right, went, but right? in the areas where you think it's going to hurt you, right? Yeah. Because if you're being told you're a loser who lives in public housing and we're not building any more public housing, and you have to house a million refugees, where do you think they're going to go? Yeah, yeah, right. And, and uh, this this makes it because I've never bought you know they're all racist that line I just I just don't buy it they're all bigots racist because you know on that yeah. basis what the the Germans in the south are more bigoted and racist and no 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 it's 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 deeper than that right or it's yeah I yeah. mean it's 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 a struggle over resources at the end of the day most things are struggles over resources I, I I read something recently I can't remember what it was but I thought it was tremendously insightful and again like most tremendously insightful things it's like kind of obvious right. So if you think about race and racism as kind of ideologies, what what do they do? They're justifications for being awful to other human beings. So why would you invent these things? Because you're being awful to other human beings. So if you think about, you know, the beginnings of the slave trade in the 1500s and 1600s, right? You are being totally awful to people. In fact, we're all being awful to each other at that period. This is the period coming out of the late Tudor period where you basically have state terrorism in England. This is Ivan the Terrible boiling his people in oil, right? I mean, it's just not a nice... This is the Inquisition, right? It's not a nice world, right? And what we do is we start to become richer, but we start to become richer by being horrible to other people. So we need to justify that. So we invent these things like hierarchy of races and racism and ideology, whatever, in a sense to allow us to continue to make scared loads of money by being awful to each other, right? So even in the beginning, even in its origins, these types of ideas come out of the kind of, if you will, the material fact that we're basically exploiting the crap out of each other. Mm. And large parts of these putatively rich Western societies have a ton of angry poor people in them, and they're making connections. And one of those connections is going to be driven through race. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah. But that this idea that there's this there's this resentment um, about what one situation and the fact that this version of capitalism just is not working out for for, for huge yeah. numbers of people and 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 anger at the politicians because as you say the, the the politicians are, are largely impotent um, and anger at anger at the media. So yep. that that's something you don't particularly address. While in the, the media's business model is to whip up the anger. I mean, you know, there's there's that's how you play both sides of the coin there. So, I mean, if you think about the culture wars, there wouldn't be any culture wars if there wasn't a platform called Facebook and there wasn't a network called Sky slash Fox. It simply wouldn't exist because you need people to go on there every night and talk about critical race theory and why it's a terrible threat, etc. You need to actually stoke those cultural tropes and symbols and, and, in a sense, go to war with them. And that's the media's business model. I always said that when Trump is voted out of office, CNN's going to lose half its audience. They didn't lose half, but they did lose 40%. Yeah. Right? And, and they're a media company, so they can't afford to do that. If you look at Vanity Fair, Vanity Fair still has a Trump story every week. It's as if the guy's still in power. <laughs> yeah. They know yeah. their audience, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is this is 3.0, and then, of course, towards the end of the book, so you, you've laid this out, and then towards the end of the book, you start you know, to offer solutions, right? How yeah, can well, we you do about all this? this right. This, this anger. So what? What does is it? Is this a, you don't describe it as such? But is there a is there a four point zero? Well, there is, and the, you know, the, the, it's going to be forced upon us. We don't really say this in the book, and I wish that we had. But I mean, you know, you 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 write things two years ago and release it, and then you're talking about it now. Um, and I think that we're we're really seeing it now is what's going to force it upon us is the climate crisis. It, it's not COVID, right? This idea that COVID's going to change the way governments operate. That's no, not going to happen. It is the fact that like Spain, large parts of Spain risk becoming a desert. Uh, it's the fact that Greece will no longer be able to do bums on beaches because it will be 50 degrees. Right? All of this is coming much faster than we think. Whether it's catastrophic floods, heavy rainfall, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, and regard and again, the wonderful thing is regardless of what we think about it, it's happening. And the number one function of the government is basically to protect its citizens. And if basically allowing everyone to keep driving cars and keep flying planes and have our business as usual and we're all going back to normal after the pandemic simply leads to more and more bad outcomes, eventually two things happen. Either the system breaks or you attempt to fix it in a much more radical way. And that's what's going to force our hand. How that plays out, that isn't anyone's guess. I mean, if Boris can read the ICC report that came out two weeks ago 
and be very solemnly freaked out about it, and a couple of days later say, yeah, I don't think we can really afford those boilers. Right? You're, you're just not serious. And if you're just not serious, this thing's going to kill you. Right? It right. really is. Not, not my generation, right? I mean, I'll sort of like, you know, I'll still have hopefully some assets to see out my dotage. But, you know, my daughter's generation is screwed. And as right. they come of age, they're going to get angrier and angrier at us, quite rightly, for consistently doing nothing. So I think the 4.0 is basically forming because of the need to decarbonize the economy. Now, we've got other stuff in the book we can talk about, sovereign wealth funds that can help with that kind of stuff, right? Uh, citizens' wealth funds, I say. But really, I think that the big action now is there in a way that I didn't think before. And so you think it's climate change and not a sort of boiling over of the culture wars and this, you know, you don't, you don't think that's that what, this, nah, this that's rising inequality is, yeah. is going mean, to cause think- civil war in places and- yeah. I don't think it's going to tip it over that way. I mean, you know, we can be really angry at each other for a very long time and society still sort of holds in, in some shape or form, right? I mean, are, are the Brits angry with each other? Yeah, I mean, remember that Labour MP that was shot by an English nationalist? I mean, you know, that's mm. shocking, but it's also thankfully rare, right? And have there been ameliorations of the model? Yeah, I mean, if you've told me just two or three years ago that a Conservative government head by Boris Johnson would do unlimited financial transfers to households in the midst of a pandemic because loads of people would be unemployed and it wouldn't be their fault. They wouldn't time limit them, they wouldn't ask for them back, and they wouldn't reach for the austerity break. I would say you're on drugs. And yet that's exactly what they've done. And they've you know, increased uh, uh, debt to GDP by around 18 20%, depending on how you count it. And the financial markets haven't moved. In fact, yields on gilts have gone down rather than up, which proves that you can do this, right? So I think that there's been a great deal of learning in this moment. The question is, are you going to take that lesson and apply it to what's coming next? Years and years ago, I saw a bumper sticker on a car in New Jersey, and it's always stuck with me. It says, nature bats last, right? And she's coming up with a big bat much sooner than you think. So, so you, okay. So, let's take the case that this is going to happen. You know, we're going to have the, the fifty yeah. degree heat in, in Greece. And so, how does that force us into four point zero? What does four point zero look like? So, if you think about it, how it's, it's a very old story, right? How do you increase wages? You increase wages essentially by increasing investment, because you no longer believe the story that the economy has a speed limit. You recognise that there's a huge amount of untapped capacity. There's a lot of demand that could be generated in the economy. And in a sense, what you're trying to do is create a kind of paradox for business in an interesting way. So I'll give you this example. Imagine that you're a sort of staunch conservative businessman and you think that whenever you give people wage increases, it inevitably leads to inflation and the whole world will fall apart. So the government comes in and says, okay, we need to get serious about decarbonization. So we're going to take all of the existing infrastructure in Scotland that's to do with oil, and we're going to start doing hydrolyzers and hydrogen transport and storage and transformation. Uh, To do that, you're going to need an absolute ton of investment. But, you know, bond markets are basically trading negative for, like, OECD sovereigns. You can raise a ton of money, particularly when people realize if they don't get it right, they're all going to die. So you probably will raise that in good terms. You start chucking all that investment and wages go up. What happens to your competitors' profits? They're going to go up. And are you going to sit on the sidelines in principled resignation about the fact that this will all end in tears, or are you going to join in? Well, eventually you'll join in, or your competitors will end up taking your lunch. So you create this kind of virtuous circle whereby it doesn't just show up in prices, it shows up in real investment. And so long as that investment is net asset positive, it creates a positive return, you literally haven't created any extra debt. You've simply swapped one form of debt, government debt as investment, for investment in fixed plant and equipment, which has a positive return. So your net debt position is actually the same. So it's, it's dead easy. There's nothing like, you know, we've never done this before. Yes, we have. We just need to actually do it seriously in its scale. Now, the interesting question then becomes, the past 40 years has been all about the private sector taking the lead. And one of the problems that we've had is because politicians haven't been required to do very much, they're crap. Right? If you were any good, you wouldn't be in politics. I mean, for God's sake, you, lot, you guys have Boris, for God's sake. I mean, really? I mean, this is a man who could barely hold down a job at The Spectator, right? So, you know, do you have the political quality of capital necessary to actually do this and see this through? That's the worry that I have. I think that basically where governments lead with investment, if you're underwriting the cost, the private sector follows. 
but it takes government to lead and that takes leadership. That's the unknown corner. Right. Okay. So, so there's a lot in there. So, so, so this, you said um, that um, the governments can get, can raise this money very easily. Yeah. Right. So, so, so why is that? And what is it that they can do that, they, right. that allows them to do so, that really easily? So, so here, For people without an the, economics background. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so here's the thing, right? The price of money, if you will, the interest rate on borrowing has been falling for 700 years, right? I'll give you the simple version of this. Did you watch Game of Thrones? No, I haven't. But I, I sort of oh, think of the right. ubiquitous for, cultural reference. All right. for, for everybody who did, right, uh, you would not invest in Cersei Lannister bonds because she'll probably kill you. If you did, you'd want a very high interest rate. But once it becomes Jon Snow bonds, because he's a nicer guy and he's less likely to kill you, the interest rate will fall. And as Jon Snow spreads peace and prosperity across the land, the, people, the number of people who are willing to lend increases. Consequently, the quantity of money goes up, so the price of the money has to fall. This has basically been going on for 700 years, with the 70s and 80s being this weird period because of inflation that affected that, but it's just been falling. Currently, $21 trillion of uh, government debt trades at a negative yield. <laughs> what does that actually mean? Yeah, what does it that means mean? That invest <laughs> All right. It means that like, if I have a bond and I issue it at 100 and it's trading at negative 5, it means that when I get it back, I only get 95 back. So why would I be willing to give a, a government 100 and in 10 years take back 95? Because at least I'll know I'll get the 95. Yeah. You want security right? And because so many people want security, they're buying these bonds. And what that means is prices go up. So the yield, the interest rate in the bond goes down. So currently there's $21 trillion of government debt that's negatively yielding. It means the investors are basically paying you to take their money. Yeah. Now, if you live in that financing environment, you do not have a constraint on investment. Your only constraint is your imagination and the courage of your politicians. Right, right, right. And so then it's a question of, okay, politicians, what are you going to do with this unique yeah. opportunity, right? That, right. That people but are going to literally which, pay you to take their money. Right. And what, what, are you what you've do with got, it? I mean, you know, Su uh, Sunak, for example, he's a pretty smart bloke. He understands this. But if he basically comes out and admits this, there is no conservative party left. There's no difference between them and Labour. All electoral competition goes away. Maybe that would be a good thing because then we could think for the long term. But all the stuff about we need to balance the budget or whatever, it's like ball nonsense, right? So long as I'm buying assets with the debt rather than just funding consumption and those assets have a positive return, I'm gaining. I'm not losing, right? If I take on debt to buy a house and every house in the neighborhood goes up and my house is now worth 100000 more than it was when I bought it, right? In what way was me taking on debt a bad idea? Hmm. It's not any different for assets that the government buys from what the private sector buys. So in a sense, it's sort of like changing our mindset on this as much as anything else. Right. But what about the problem of, of you know, the government picking winners, right? How, how can we trust the government sure. to get it right? Absolutely. No, that's it. But then again, what you do is you pick the infrastructure for winners. You don't pick the winners, right? I mean, if you're going to share, you're going to need something to move food around. Trucks are a pretty efficient way of moving food. If you don't want to burn gasoline anymore, petrol, sorry, if you don't want to do that anymore, you're going to have to find a surrogate. And the surrogate is either battery power or hydrogen. It's out, it's, the jury's out as to whether it would be hydrogen, but if we can make it work, it'd be way better than batteries, right? Because basically it's just hydrolyzing and, and the net result at the end is water, right? I mean, I'm looking for a downside, right? So if you can get that to work, that's awesome. So what you do is you chuck tons and tons of cash into the infrastructure and the conversion of that uh, gasoline infrastructure into hydrogen. And then you let the private sector figure it out. Right. But how, okay. So, okay. So we might be solving climate change problems, but how are we solving inequality? Because isn't that money going to businesses, to capitalists? Well, then you could put certain, you could put certain rules around getting the investment, right? You could do things like, well, by the way, if your company does well out of this, you don't get to do share buybacks to enrich the people in the C-suite anymore. Oh, by the way, we actually are going to put up your taxes on your profits. There's going to be a minimum corporate tax globally, which we're already beginning to see, right? And then we can distribute that. In terms of carbon taxes, I'm a bit of a skeptic on this, but if you are going to do that, if you're going to make things like gasoline more expensive for ordinary people, what you should do with the money that you generate is not worry about the bonds that you're issuing and try and pay back those bonds. You should do what Alaska does every year and just give everybody a check. 
And that's a really effective form of redistribution because in a sense what you're doing is that you're taxing the companies, but you're taxing the end users for gasoline. That's normal people. They hate that. They're already struggling, right? But what if I took the money from that tax, which is encouraging less use and encouraging the firms to get out of producing carbon, and at the end of the year, I shower you with a Christmas present, which is basically the receipt to the tax. You, and in fact, I'll give you a tax break on top of that if you trade in your gasoline car and go get something electric, right? So there are ways that you can make this work. Again, none of this is that complex. It's just a question of commitment. Right, right. Uh, and, and the argument is that by doing putting these... Um, you know, put, putting these restrictions on the firms when they take the cash in order to, to sort of address the inequality problem, you're not going to cause the same problems as, as version 2.0. No, because what you had back then, and this is crucially important, so I'm glad you mentioned it, is you didn't have a globalized world. You had very, very isolated national economies that all made the same stuff and occasionally swapped them. So, you know, the Brits made cars and they were shit, and they swapped them with the Swedes who made Volvos that were slightly better. And they made herring, which we didn't eat, but we made something else that they wanted, right? And that was how it was. But they were very much national economies, right? What we have now is an entirely globalized economy, and it's really hard to create inflation in, in the global economy. Because, you know, you, you're talking about the whole planet, right? It's not like British workers pricing themselves out of jobs in this little thing called the British economy. It's British workers versus workers everywhere else in the world. So if you're pushing up wages, it has to, in a sense, be paid for by either taking from the excess of those at the top, which I'm totally fine with, uh, and then uh, another way of doing it is by increasing the productivity of those workers. And you can do that through investment. So, you know, you work on it on both sides. Right, right. Now, you mentioned early, earlier the, the, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, which I thought was really interesting. And it, it's using this same mechanism, right? These government, governments have got this yep. this golden opportunity where people are oh, paying them to take their money. And then the idea is, right, if, I get, if I've got this right, is that governments take that and then they put it in the stock market, a bit like the way Norway yeah. does now with, with the money that it's got. That's exactly it. So, you know, Norway, Singapore have a version of this as sovereign wealth funds. And we like the idea of not just calling them, but making them citizens' wealth funds. So what's a citizens' wealth fund? There's a big firm over here in America, which I think still exists in the United Kingdom, called Fidelity. Fidelity is a brokerage. And what that means is you can walk in off the street and say, can, can I open an account with you and you buy me some stocks? And they're like, great. And then, you know, you can do this and that's your own little portfolio. Knock yourself out. So imagine that the state was able to do this on behalf of all of its citizens, not just like some shadowy fund that it taps into for whatever purposes. Clear separation. Politicians don't get anywhere near it. You constitute it with a board that has citizens that has professional investors, you have lawyers, you know, whatever. You make it sort of isolated and clean and transparent. And the mechanism is very simple, as you said before, but it, it works better in a financial crisis. So this is the weird thing about it. Our argument is that there's going to be financial crises, there's an upside. And what's the upside? Whenever uh, there's a financial crisis, stock markets fall about 40 to 50%. People don't want to hold equities. They don't want to hold shares. Why? Because they think that the cash flows that justify the valuation of those shares are going to dry up. And they're probably right. And that means that the value of the share has to fall. So what do you want to do? You want to sell the share before the next person sells it. So everybody sells it all at once and you get this absolutely catastrophic collapse in the share price, which in no way reflects the fundamentals of the company. What do we do just now? At that point in time, central banks come in and say, oh, never mind. I'll put a floor under prices here. I'll chuck loads of money at the economy called quantitative easing. That'll push up house prices and make you feel better. Maybe you'll buy some stocks. And extremists will even buy some of the stocks. But then we'll hand it back to the private sector. So what we say is, well, hang on a minute. Why are we doing that? That's giving insurance to the parts of society that are already the most insured. Well, Which basically is what they screwing hate. everybody That's a big else part over. Of the anger. Right, it's exactly right. And they're quite right, they hate it. That's absolutely right. So what we are saying is the following. When those stock markets fall, what is it that investors buy? They buy government bonds because they want that security. And they buy so many of them that the price goes through the roof and the yield goes negative. In other words, they're paying you to issue the debt. So issue an extra 20% of GDP, 20% of the value of the economy, and buy all those stocks at half price. Put them into a very large passive fund. It's not nationalization. You're not interested in seats on the board. You're not interested in control of the companies. You basically take no more than perhaps you know, 3 to 5% of any given firm, ideally less than 1%. But you just buy as many different things as you can globally. And you kind of run it like fidelity, fidelity for the people. And then what happens is you let the magic of what economists call the equity premium take over. 
And what's that? The difference between equities and bonds is generally 5 to 6% a year net of inflation. So if you compound a portfolio of everything at 5 to 6% a year, and you do that for 20 years, you take the American economy, the American economy is about $20 trillion, right? If you do 20% of that, it's $4 trillion. You do $4 trillion at a 6% compounding for 20 years, basically you're getting about $2 trillion, $2.5 trillion for showing up, right? Now, I'd say, you know, you, you, you haven't taxed anyone, right? Literally, just by doing this, you've made a couple of trillion. So all of those indebted millennials that are putting off marriage, that can't buy houses, that aren't consuming, that's bad for the economy, why don't we wipe out all those student loans? Because we can do it now. We don't have to tax anyone to do it. Right. <laughs> Done, right? Yeah. You want to fund the big infrastructure projects in your green transition? Biden's stuff now is three and a half trillion and everyone's getting freaked out. It's three and a half trillion over 10 years. It's 350 billion on a $20 trillion economy. It's not that big. But if you could generate an extra three trillion over 10 years and put it where it matters and you don't have to tax anyone to do it, why would you not do it? Right, right, yeah. And, and so what's been the experience of these countries like Norway and, and, and Singapore who've got these funds? You know, how, how does it actually work? Can a citizen, does a citizen have like a, like a private account? They could go ask the trustees, can I, can well, they, I want, well, they I want don't. a new house? I mean, the, can you give me some money? <laughs> Well, this is the thing. The Norwegian one was set up at such a time that nobody really thought through what you do with these things. And the Singaporean one is like, also, we are a small, vulnerable city state and we need to have a big insurance policy. So they don't do it for disbursement and investment. They do it as insurance. And that's led to the rise of a populist party in Norway that basically was like, un you know, open up the piggy bank. <laughs> Give us the money, yeah. right? And of course, people want this over the short term, and that's not exactly what you don't want to do, right? But what you could do with this, and this is something we talk about in the book, is why is it that only the rich should get inheritances? Let's assume you don't want to do anything on climate change, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Imagine that you got that at $2 trillion, and then you keep reinvesting the surplus of this, and, and over that 10 years, there's been another financial crisis, so you just do the same trick again, right, and compound the next law, right? You're never going to socialize the economy, but what you're doing is you're giving everyone who's a citizen a stake in the capital stock of the country, right? You really are fulfilling, in a way, Mrs. Thatcher's dream of a property-owning democracy, but it's held in trust for everyone. Well, all trust funds disburse. So imagine that you're 18 or 21 years old. 18 years old, you want to go to college? There's your National Wealth Fund dividend. You're 21 years old, you didn't go to college, you want to start a business? Here's your version of the dividend, right? That you could structure this in tons of ways that would be massively beneficial for people. Right. And would address the problems with 3.0. Exactly. That's the lack of inequality. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and what I like about the proposal, right? I mean, well, actually, before I get onto that, what about those who will say, well, this just breeds a dependency culture and, you know, people won't get off their asses if they, you know, they know that this free run is coming down the line. What's the motivation for them to work hard? You know, what? what yeah, I mean, there's actually, I mean, it's a great rhetoric, but there's actually very little evidence that, that actually happens. And I'll give you why, right? I mean, let's do a counterfactual on taxes. If people knew that they had to pay taxes on their earnings and they were going to earn a lot of money, would they never invest in the first place? Mm -hmm. So are we honestly saying that Steve Jobs, if Steve Jobs no, knew that he would have ended up paying billions of dollars in taxes, he wouldn't have bothered doing Apple? Well, no, that doesn't hold, right? right. And just because, just because I know that at the age of 18, I'm going to get a $5,000 handout. Yeah, if you have a really crap society where for people that is a huge amount of money and they've got nothing else going on, let's give them the 5000 because it might transform their lives, right? Because it's only $5,000 or whatever it would happen to be. If it's more than that, you can put caveats around it. No, no, you don't get to go drinking with this. This is only if you want to go to university or however you want to play it, right? then you can make it work. It's got to be a productive use. It's an investment in the human capital stock of your, of your nation. Right, right. And I get we have experience of private trust funds and, and making them yeah, work, right? right. So I mean, we, look, we, seriously, we, from we that. know that this crap works because rich people do it all the time. Like Whenever I see rich people doing rich things, people you know become, it works. Right, right, right absolutely. Right. And of course, some of those trust fund kids become delinquent and, and don't have productive lives. They but do, it's not, absolutely. But the, in a the sense, that's because they have too much. That's because they have too much, right? If you honestly know that every year Papa's going to disburse $200,000, yeah, you'll go to World Williamsburg and be a slacker, right? And have a, and just be an arse, right? There's no doubt about it, right? But we're not talking about that. We're talking about a one-time $10,000 that could transform your life if you're a poor person.
Yeah. With 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 real with guardrails around it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then presumably in, in economies like the states, where you've got you've got this added problem, and you talk about this in the book in uh, Angrynomics, that uh, people don't uh, have access to medical care, right? In yeah. The way that we have in, in Europe, which was really shocking to me, and I'm sure it was to you when you first went to the states. To, just the difference. Oh, it still is absolutely. <laughs> Um, that presumably then this trust fund, you know, this wealth fund could be used for those purposes as well. Yeah, you could you could decide for whatever purposes it is. I mean, I think it would be shockingly unproductive if we used it for basically end of life care, so that the medical industry in the United States can continue to reap profits it should never reap. But conceivably, I don't see why you would want to do that because the U.S. is a society where a cancer diagnosis can bankrupt a family. And that's yeah. just the moral and wrong. Yeah, I mean, there's a story in the book of the guy, a guy you met in Florida, right? Who, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, he's, he's paying back his daughter's operation by working into his retirement. He'll never fully pay it off. But if you wanted to save her life, it was, you know, a million dollars of heart surgery. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and the United <laughs> Kingdom, you know, for all of the, the, the wailing and gnashing of teeth about the NHS, you don't, have to, you don't face that problem. Yeah, I remember I was shocked when I was in the States and I met a guy who was working on reception in the hotel I was staying at and uh, he, he was telling me the story of him and his girlfriend and his girlfriend had, had an eye infection. And uh, the doctor said to him, you know, this might, said to, to them, right, this, this might clear up. Uh, in fact, in all likelihood, this will clear up, but there is a, a small risk that this infection will get worse uh, and you might lose the sight in your eye. And, and the cost was like five, you know, like a few thousand dollars, but they didn't have mm-hmm. a few thousand dollars. So like, right. okay, we'll take the risk. And she ends up with one eye. That I, mean, oh. it, it, I was completely shocked. I, I know, like, I know. It's that, incredible. That would, ha- would not happen anywhere in Europe. It's, it's, it was extraordinary. No, that no absolutely. No, I mean, the, the, the stories I could tell you about, you know, people moving between states and jobs and then falling out of coverage and then no one will cover the costs and all this sort of stuff. It's a horror. It is literally the most horrible system imaginable. And uh, yet it persists. And I actually don't understand why, because really, I mean, so I've spoken to lots of corporate people, and they all hate the fact that, like, if they advertise a job for someone for sixty thousand dollars, the actual real cost is ninety thousand dollars because they have to provide benefits, which includes healthcare. So either you stop providing the benefits, which means that less and less people have healthcare, and then the United States just now around forty-five million people don't have any regular healthcare, right? Or alternatively, you have to shove more of the costs onto them, right? Which means that their real wage is less, which means that their angst level and their anger goes up. It's just a truly horrible system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, I, I, I liked, um, you know, that idea. When you talk about it, there's a risk associated, but then there's a risk with anything, risk with right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the biggest risk, partic- to go back to the climate issue, the biggest risk is doing nothing. Yeah. Right. Because if you do nothing, eventually, you know, we live in these highly complex, ultra fragile societies that are held together by incredibly fragile supply chains and so on and so forth. And yes, the pandemic showed that they can you know, survive or whatever. We just got whacked with a hurricane in Rhode Island, which is where I'm sitting, right? And the damage wasn't that great, thankfully. But I went to the supermarket. I was in New York at the weekend and I came back up and I thought, I better do the week shopping. I went to the supermarket, it was empty. <laughs> right. I mean, we're only two days away from like, I'm sorry, that truck's not coming and people don't have food. Right. So if you just continue to do nothing, and, you know, the big one for America is the American West. They've been overtapping the groundwater for years. I mean, California is these giant monocultural, uh, monoculture agricultural areas, uh, avocados as far as the eye can see, which is incredibly water intensive, etc. And it's lovely, like, you know, I can get an avocado for a dollar. It's fabulous, right? But at the same time, that all relies on one thing called the Colorado River. It's at an all-time low, and it's not going to get any better. So, you know, when people start talking about the United States and it's a superpower in China and Afghanistan and all that, I just tune it out. Because the really important thing is, can the United States be a superpower if the West dries up over the next 20 years? Mm. Can it feed itself in 30 years? That's right. the question you need to be asking. And if you're not focusing on that stuff, you're basically bullshitting. Right, right, right. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that um, you, you've used the vehicle of the nation state, right? Because there's definitely a seemingly, seemingly a movement, certainly a lot amongst the, you know, the, the, the elites, let's say, to sort of denigrate yes. the nation and um, Absolutely. You know, to look for global solutions. But it's interesting here that you've, you've sort of 
you've, you've made their nation central in, in your ideas here. I think because what the globalized, the high globalization period did, and you know the critique of the cosmopolitan elites and all the rest of it, um, I think it's true, right, to a large extent. Because I'm one of them. I mean, I'd recognise it, right? You know, I know the inside of first class lounges and airports all over the world, right? Why? That's kind of ridiculous, right? So you know, we live in this kind of you know internationalized, deracinated state where everyone's a highly skilled individual. But the cost of that has been basically the, you know, the impoverishment of large parts of our societies. And what nationalism in the nation does is it reminds you that the people you share space with are your fellow citizens, that there are obligations that go with. There's a very old language that's both liberal and conservative here about rights and responsibilities, about duties and obligations to each other and vis-a-vis the state. And the reason the state exists is because it's, if you will, that collective check on our individual shittiness. And we've just allowed that to atrophy and tell us our stories about how it's horrible, we don't need it, etc., etc. So then you can end up with a kind of pathological, ethnicized version of nationalism versus us versus them. But if, you don't have to. If you have a version of the nation which basically says that we are the citizens, we get to vote, there's a congruence between our electoral choices and the policies that are followed by the agents that they put there, that they're not beholden to some other elites, transnational or whatever, then that creates a kind of, if you will, to use a very old language, a social contract that's kind of robust. And that then allows you to basically respect your fellow citizens and expect things from them in return in a way that we simply don't have now. To me, the kind of the high point of this awfulness is this whole movement in behavioral economics called Nudge. Yeah. So there's a book that came out a few years ago, Nudge, right? And it's like, oh, look how clever we are. We've discovered all these cognitive biases in people. Now we can trick them into doing things. And it's like, all right, so rather than actually like, you know, meet people who are overweight and talk about why they're overweight and figure out that basically they live in food deserts, the, the, the nearest supermarket in parts of Harlem is 25 blocks away, but there's 55 fast food regiments, restaurants. Maybe we should do something about that. No, no, we'll just say that the fat, it's their fault. We need to have a sugar tax. And then we'll put the sugar tax on them. Or they won't let us do the sugar tax. All right, we'll figure out some clever behavioral twist whereby we're making them consume less sugar. What you're doing is you're dividing the world into super smart people with all the money called the nudgers. And mm. everybody else who's not your fellow citizen that you need to engage with and respect, a bunch of people to be nudged into behaviors that you happen to like. Now, you know, in terms of overall shittiness, ethnic nationalism is pretty shitty, but that comes a close second. Mm. And that's kind of where we got to. And I think we really need to dial it back in from there and, and reinvigorate, if you will, that very old language of a kind of social contract based around citizenship in the nation. Yeah, but, but with it, and I think this is the point you made, with it, as a, an economic framework which, which puts us, sends us back in the other direction towards rising equality, right? So we don't have, because yeah. it, it seems to me the, the, the more we've got inequality, the, the more we're going to have the rise of populism. And, you know, the, the 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 more difficult it is for us to build cohesive nations, and by tipping us back in the other direction, you know we've got more of a chance. It seems to me of of people respecting a social contract. Right? I think that's right, and you know, and this is where the sort of the shortcut to ethnicization is unfortunate, but you can see why people do it. You know, why do you trust each other because they have similar life circumstances to you? Why do you trust each other because somehow their behaviours, their expectations, the way they look is somewhat similar to you, right? And that's that shorthand that you use. And the problem is when politicians weaponize those shorthands into an us versus them, thinking the classic anti-immigrant stuff, right? Now, to go back to our earlier example, yeah, I mean, if you're living in public housing in East Germany, the chances of any immigrants actually showing up is remarkably small, but it's actually quite rational to fear that if the government's going to take stuff from a budget, it's going to be yours and not the rich people in the South that don't rely on the government budget, right? So you can see how that instantly gets politicized, but it doesn't have to. I mean, what pains me with the conversation about immigration is that because we've made the society so unequal, we're having less kids, but we're having more old people that we need to look after. Is it an accident that loads of nurses in the NHS don't come from Hemel Hempstead? Right? Is it an accident that there are lots of Romanian doctors? It's not because we were undercutting British doctors with prices, we just weren't producing enough. Right, so you, any growing society needs immigration, and then you can have a question about how you want to do that, how you want to manage that. 
But the knee jerk, we need to keep them out and stabilize the borders, it's kind of suicidal because if you don't have enough kids and you have too many old people relative to those kids, your economy is going to shrink just by definition, right? You have less workers producing less stuff and more people who need the, who need the stuff you're producing. So you've got to have that as part of the conversation. They can be citizens too. It's just a question of like, what do we mean by the terms of that citizenship contract? Right. But then what about those who are, who are responding to the fertility pro- crisis like Hungary and now China with its three-child policy who are actively encouraging and incentivizing people to have more kids uh, as a way to relieve their reliance on immigration? It, it's, it's really interesting. It, not only does it not work, right? Basically, everybody normalizes it just below the replacement level. Even the most equal countries, even the Swedes and everybody like that, they're marginally better, right? These policies, prenatal policies are expensive. They help, right? If you know that you can basically have six months leave, paid leave in the first like six months of the child's life, yeah, that'll incentivize you to do it. But if you don't have a house and you can't afford one, you're not even going to think about it in the first place. So you have to deal with those underlying inequalities. Otherwise, this is putting icing on a cake and there's no cake, right? Now, in terms of the China stuff, yes, I mean, you went one way and now you can probably go the other way a little bit more uh, to stop that kind of demographic crunch. But what we find is, particularly with rich countries, even when you bring in immigrants, within two generations, their fertility rates drop to the national norm. So what you have to do is just make it attractive for, more attractive for everyone to have more kids. And that means investment in schools, it means investment in daycare, it means investment in elder care so that you're not stuck doing that all of which, you know, costs money. Well, then you're going to have to figure out a way to pay for that. Maybe you could roll that into, if you call it, the social infrastructure of infrastructure rebuilds, which is what the Biden administration is trying to do with their big 3.5 billion. We'll see. But nonetheless, you know, on its own, it's not going to solve the problem. As part of recognizing there is a problem, it's a good move. Right, right. And I also think that businesses, I mean, there's obviously what we've been talking about is sort of state level policy, but um, what, my research on firms that are taking much more aggressive, progressive approaches to remuneration, right? And they've got a much smaller gap between the, the salary of the CEO. And yeah. those, so that they're, they're narrowing the, the, the spread of, of wage distributions. They're finding that their employees, you know, anecdotally, this is, I have more kids, right? Yeah. And, and they've got much more pro- progressive policies around childcare and so on. Um, So it can actually be done at a firm level, I think, as well as at a state level. But so why not, you know, but the way to weaponize that is, you know, just don't leave it to the firms. I mean, it's a bit like the climate change question, right? Um, If you leave it to the private sector, everyone will talk a good game of ESG and nothing will happen. Because it's individually any firm, even BlackRock, they can't solve that, right? Another reason we have states is states solve our collective action problems, right? They basically just go, no more diesel. Okay, problem solved, right? BlackRock can't really go no more diesel, and Tesla can't do it even if they make their cars cheaper, right? So you need to have both sides of this working on it. Where the state goes and creates the conditions of investment, then the private sector follows. That's always been true. You just need to actually do it. Right, right, yeah. Yeah. Wow, well, um... (laughs) I, I I think we've done an hour. That was great. Yeah. I feel like, um, yeah, I feel really energized for the conversation, Mark, I have to say. Good. Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great book. Um, and I know you've written others, right? You've written Austerity, which I haven't re- re- read. Um, but I, you know, I do recommend this as a non-economist. Uh, you know, that's could, that's uh, what it's I, for. It's, the, it's, it's for everybody else. And, and yeah, um, roll on. <laughs> Capitalism 4.0. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I really hope we get there because if we don't, <laughs> nature bats last. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's interesting. So you, 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 you're sort of motivated by this, obviously, from the climate perspective. To say for me, it's more about the, the, the kind of the cultural decline that we're seeing. But I think from either lens, you know, this is an yeah. important conversation. It's just a different way to get to the same point is we want more sustainable societies that are genuinely prosperous for the majority of people. Yeah. Like, I don't think there is, I, the, the number of people who aren't on that train is actually very small. It's just that we've allowed the politicization of these things to become so extreme that we can't actually stop long enough to realize that we want many, many times the same things.
Well, exactly. I mean, the far right and the far left want exactly the same thing. You know, they want a more pro- mus- a fairer, more prosperous society for their fam- right. families. It's it's like the, the, they want exactly the same thing. They've just got different ways. Very, of- very different definitions that stop them ever getting together to solve the problem. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. Good. Thank you, Mark.